So good evening. Uh, um, welcome to uh, this meeting of the natural history section. Uh, we're very pleased to uh, have with us this evening Adrian Russell, who's the county recorder for uh, moths uh, for uh, VC55, Leicestershire and Rutland. Um, Adrian, say, uh, it says in, in the blurb, it says a 37 year veteran of garden moth trapping. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, but I'm no doubt he'll tell us. Um, he's attracted a very large audience, the largest online audience that we've ever had. So um, I'm certainly looking forward to his talk. So Adrian, we'll, we'll hand over to you. Uh, okay, well, I hope I don't let you down. I, I struggled to come up with a, a title. So this is what came to the top of my head when I was uh, originally asked and then and the subsequent months, I completely forgot what on earth I was going to talk about. So uh, I had to, uh, had to quickly remind myself. This is a true multimedia presentation. So I hope you can hear the sound too. <laughs> this is called Building Up the Tension. Okay, let's cut to the chase. Just really going to focus on the increasing popularity of garden moth trapping. I think it's not just certainly the case in Leicestershire and Rutland, but I think it applies uh, nationally as well. So I've done a tally of the number of garden moth traps that were operating in VC55 sort of over the years, um, sort of starting from 1980. And you can see you know, it used to be a relatively modest number, I and mean, it sort of gradually rose to something over 40. It had a slight dip for some reason, but then a big increase. So currently um, in 2019, we had 75 moth trappers running garden moth traps. But actually there's one or two who haven't submitted records yet or may not have run traps uh, in that particular year. And I know there's at least 12 people running garden moth traps who don't send in records. But I can say confidently we've got over 100 garden moth trappers in the county. As a consequence of this and the general popularity in moth recording, number of records has risen dramatically um, from relatively modest numbers in the 1980s up to we're now sort of uh, touching 90,000 records a year, which keeps me busy. And if we look at where those traps are operating, so these were where traps are operating in 1980, fairly central in the county. 1990, we've got a slightly wider spread by then. 2000s, we've got traps operating in Rutland at last then. 2010, even more. But you'll also notice 2010 saw the formation of what I call the Western Circle. Uh, it's a circle of garden moth trap sites, which you can often detect in species distribution maps, as in the, uh, the map there for the small ranunculus. And you'll see 2019, we've got a really good uh, coverage. There's still some the usual blank areas in the county and we've got a few 10 kilometer squares with no one got moth trapping in the northeast the north the west and the south <coughs> and when we plot them all these are all garden trap sites over the years um you'll see, still see the greatest coverage is in the west but at least we're getting a more widespread picture now So what's behind the increasing popularity of garden moth trapping? Well, my first thought was, well, we've got a lot better books over the years. Some of us were thought uh, the Skinner that was published in 1984 was, was uh, the best book ever, and it certainly beat everything prior to then. But I think it's really the more popular guides, the uh, Waring and Townsend published in 2003, and Sterling and Parsons, the Micromoth book in 2012. 
I think they were sort of very usable guides. And with two volumes, you could pretty much identify 90% of the moths that you caught. Well, that was a theory anyway. Uh, coupled with that, we've obviously got uh, national websites like UK Moths, which started in 2005, and Nature Spot 2009. But it still really doesn't explain that big jump in the sort of uh, 2015 onwards. Uh, and I've been trying to think of a reason for that. And I think one of the reasons is the advent of digital photography, the ability to take good quality photographs with your mobile phone. And no longer do you have to set specimens to share uh, images of what you've caught with someone else. And there you've got email and social media that all help uh, the ability to share what you've caught with other people. And I think perhaps the other reason is um, in the last few years, uh, we've been making some low cost traps available for VC55 moth recorders. So you'll see there on the uh, left, a Robinson trap. That's a commercially made trap that sell for over 300 pounds. Whereas the traps that we're producing uh, can be supplied for as little as 60 pounds. So that's good to, people can make a start without committing a lot of experience, not knowing whether they're really gonna take some moth trapping. But perhaps the main reason is it's fun. Now, when giving a talk, one should always be mindful of the nature of one's audience. So perhaps that picture is more appropriate. <coughs> I hope I've not offended anyone with that. Now, moth trapping out and about in the countryside is the most wonderful thing. You'll see uh, a fabulous range of species and it really takes some beating. But there is a downside. You'll need an expensive generator. It can be very cold. You might have to carry equipment. And of course, naturally it's dark. So uh, in comparison, putting out a garden moth trap is a lot easier. Basically switched on at dusk, get up in the morning, switch it off, see what you've caught. And when you do start garden moth trapping, you're able to see uh, variations through the season. So you get a progression of moths so in winter, you've got things like the winter moth, the satellite, and if you're lucky, a dotted chestnut. And what I've done, to give you an idea of the sort of what you'll catch, this is my spreadsheet for January 2020. And you'll see um, it wasn't a particularly cold month, but just getting ones or twos and a lot of pretty blank traps on some nights. But it's nice when spring starts to appear. The first thing you'll see is the range of Quaker species, like the common Quaker on the top left. But there's lots of other interesting and quite attractive moths that uh, start appearing. Below the common Quakers, an oak beauty. Top right is a chocolate tip, very photogenic species. And bottom right is a lime hawk moth. And that's actually the uh, brick red form, which is quite attractive. And when you look at the uh, sort of totals you perhaps get from running a moth trap, this is April in my garden moth trap, and you'll see the numbers are still manageable, but getting a much bigger range of species starting to appear. But moth trapping really comes into its own in summer, I could show you endless pictures of the sorts of species that you'll catch. Okay, there are a lot of brown moths, but even things like the heart and heart are attractive. Numbers of those will build up in June. Brimstone moth, top right, they'll be a, a common feature in the moth trap. Another very attractive moth, the gold spot, and magpies, which you don't tend to see as often these days. Now, I couldn't fit the whole of my uh, July spreadsheet onto the screen. So this is just the, the bottom lines. You will see the totals there in July, over a hundred moths on some nights, 30, 40, 50 species. And you see that some species like the uncertain 
yes, there is a moth called the uncertain. Um, that was a ever present in good numbers. Similar in August, but even bigger totals this August and uh, topping 200 moths a night. I should say, my for those of you who don't know, I mine's a very ordinary, modest sized garden on the very edge of Leicester, very suburban. So I don't catch as many moths as those people living in more rural areas. You'll see in August, the square spot rustic, plenty of those. But actually, uh, You'll see the uncertain, which dominated in July, numbers of those die away as you progress through the month. And gradually the very similar looking vines rustic starts to build up in numbers. And this is nice where you see, you know, the, the progression of different species coming and going through the year. Okay, this is the large yellow one doing. And it's not a favorite of moth trappers. And some nights in summer, you can get hundreds. They're quite attractive, they say, but they're very boisterous. And the problem is you open a trap on a hot summer morning and these just go berserk and fly out in all directions. So not the most popular of species. Now, this is one of them. Um, hoping someone can get me a good photograph of a VC55 large yellow underwing showing its yellow underwings. So for those of you up for a photographic challenge, here it is. Uh, I don't know where I lifted this photograph from, but this is the sort of thing I'd love someone to, uh, to catch for me. And that's the other nice thing about gone moth dropping. If you're interested in photography, there's plenty of opportunities um, to photograph moths from tiny little moths like uh, this Plutella porectella that John Tinning gets regularly in his Quenibra garden, uh, but I've yet to see. So there again, that shows how things can, can vary. Some people will catch a lot of something, others won't see it. And if you're really an artistic photographer, then you can produce, well, I don't know whether you'd be challenged to produce photographs as good as this, uh, Jean Piero's photograph of a scarce silver lines. Very artistic. So in, in summer, July and August is the peak period for catches. These are my uh, best ever totals for garden moth trapping. 1st of August, 2013. I caught the most species in one night, 619 moths of 122 species. And actually, there are only six large yellow underwings there. So um, that was my biggest number of species in one night. As for the biggest total of number of moths, 5th of July 2018, 914 moths. Although 557 of those were water veneers. And yes, I did count them. Now, water veneers are an interesting little species. It's a micromoth. The larvae are entirely aquatic. Uh, the males uh, are winged and fly. Females come in two forms, wingless, who basically stay in the water, and some are winged. And what they do, as many aquatic species do, they ten, can swarm. So just the odd night in the year, you might get a whole trap full of water veneers. And, uh, Regrettably, most of them tend to be dead, but thankfully this doesn't happen that often. But it shows, you probably wouldn't notice these in your garden if you were out at night, but just shows the numbers that can come to a moth trap. <coughs> then as autumn arrives, you're probably getting fed up in August with all the uh, common brown moths, so it's nice when you start to get some of the, uh, the sallows, got the sallow top left, uh, bottom left, the center barred sallow, and top right, the pink barred sallow. And these, because they're autumnal moths, so they tend to reflect the colors of autumnal leaves. And another nice one that usually appears in most people's uh, trap in the summer, late summer, early autumn, is a red underwing. 
And again, if we look at the totals from my garden off trout in September this year, you'll see still the one or two good nights, but the numbers are gradually uh, reducing. But not only do you get uh, variations through the year, but you also get variations between years. Some species have good years, some species have bad years. And you know, I always say that garden moth trapping is relatively inefficient. In any one year, you won't catch all of the species that are present in your garden or the immediate area. And it takes time to build up a species list or to get to see uh, the range of species that are in the area. But on top of that, there are those species that are either very rare, they may be new colonizers to the area or the county, or migrants. And these certainly add to the interest. So this is uh, the tree lichen beauty, which we knew it was spreading from the south of England, and we're expecting it, and it did finally turn up in 2018 in Michael Lester's garden and then in 2019 a whole host of other sites. But what you'll see is they're nearly, all, with one exception, they're all garden records. Now without the, that garden trapping data we wouldn't really know what was happening with this species and this is where I, I think gardens are useful not only just for telling us which garden moths are present in the county but they act as like sort of early warning stations they alert us to species that are arriving and perhaps colonizing the area the other beauty is the more records we can get the more interesting things you can note so if you look down at the dates here you'll see that in 2019 we had you know two arrive different ends of the county on the same night, 26th of July. Two later in Weston, two days later in Weston. And then look at the 3rd of August, 2019. Three recorded on the very same night. So what's going on here? That's the question. Are these migrants? Are they things that arrived in 2018 and suddenly all spring to life on the 3rd of August? I can't answer those questions, but at least we've got the data to at least try and understand what's going on here. I thought I'd uh, include this species for um, one of our honourable committee members. Uh, Oncocera semi-rubella first appeared in the county in Dave Gamble's Leicester Forest East Garden in 2019. And then we had a second record from Raiders Garden in July of this year. So that's another species that we can expect to see more frequently in the county. This is perhaps the most famous moth ever caught in VC55. It's the Pinecone Tortrix, and this was caught in uh, Andy Johnson's Dadlington Garden in 2013. And it's only the second record of this species from the British Isles. And I'm only aware of one subsequent record. So it's still a very, very rare moth. But the interesting thing to note is Andy caught this in his only his second year of moth recording. Some might say beginner's luck, but everyone has the same chance of catching these things. So that's something I think is very unique about garden moth trapping. Just take a drink. I think anyone who's interested in moths will admit this is a very special sea species. And we've been lucky that um, it returned to the county after an absence of over 100 years in 2019. And again, you'll see it turned up at a variety of sites, mainly gardens in that year. And then this year, I'm aware of at least six other records. And again, the question is, we knew this was expanding um, from the south, where it's colonising parts of uh, Britain. 
but it's also a, a migrant species. So we know it's present in the county now. What we don't know is, is it actually breeding here? Are those um, 2020 records the result of those that came in 2019? Uh, we still don't know yet, but it's an aspen feeder and it would be good to, if we could at some stage try and confirm the exact status of this beautiful moth in the county. So you notice there the people have caught it, not the, uh, I was going to say most deserving moth recorders like myself. Those who have been at it for years have been missing out on this little beauty. I've got my fingers crossed for next year though. <clears throat> well, what you, if you get into garden moth trapping, what you can gradually do is you'll build up a garden species list. And I actually started just 37 years ago um, in the same garden. And I tried to run my moth trap every night of the year, rain or shine. And I've added new species to my garden list every year. Now, I wonder if that happens in any other form of wildlife recording in one's garden. I very much doubt it. By the end of 2019, I've recorded 690, sorry, 664 species of moth from my garden. And this year I've added another eight, even though it's been a pretty average year, really. And those eight included a convolvulus hawk moth. This is another of those species that everyone really would love to catch in their trap. And actually most records don't come from moth recorders. This species has a tendency to rest in the daytime on uh, obvious places like gate posts or front doors. It's not very good at hiding by all accounts, but there again, when you're that big, you don't perhaps worry about predators so much. But I actually got one in my moth trap on the 1st of September after 38 years. I've only recorded this species once before in BC 55, and that was on the 6th of August, 1960. 60 years ago, when I was aged just three. I've got no memories really from my childhood, but I do remember vividly, I found this one on our side of our shed, pointed it out to my dad and we took it into the museum where they identified it. And many years later, I tracked it down. I think it's one of those moths there in the last year collection. But I think that's quite an achievement, seeing a moth only twice, but 60 years apart. Also makes me feel a bit old, I must admit. Anyway, so, so what's the value of garden moth records? I think, as I said, they help us detect the presence of species that are either rare or low density in the county. They also help us to detect changes in abundance within the county. And it's often very easy to see the changes as new species arrive and increase in numbers. What's harder to spot is the declining species, things like the garden tiger, which used to be so common, but now is a real rarity. Garden trapping also helps us to identif and identify the distribution of species, and sort of filling in the gaps. So for something like the large yellow underwing, you can see there, that's all our records to date. And it, the more records you get from different areas, the more it provides a, a clearer picture of something that's either ubiquitous or for something like a small running curse, something that has a restricted range. It's a bit like uh, having a high definition picture. So that's why I'm always keen, anyone who's garden moth dropping, to send in records for all, anywhere, because it always helps. It's also, the more records you have, the better quality phenology charts you can produce. So this is a flight chart for the leopard moth and uh, plotted all the dated records in the database, 395 records on a weekly basis. And you'll see a very clear picture there of when it flies. And you can produce some nice statistics of the earliest date, 
on average the first date it's seen each year, etc. And again, the more records you have, the better quality charts like this are. But the big concern is, can garden records skew data? So we've seen how the number of garden traps has increased dramatically, and how the number of records has increased dramatically. So I've done a little pie chart showing uh, moth records per decade. So you see the green are records from the 2010s and blue from the 2000s. And those post-1999 records account for 84% of all the records in the database. And I'd estimate that 90% of those records are garden records. So you'll see it is tending to dominate the database. If we look at a distribution map for the Southern Wainscot, you might look at that map and say, oh yes, it's pretty much found all over the county. But it's a species that uh, lives inside reeds as a, a larva. So what I've done here is produced a distribution map separating out those sites where there are reed beds and those that are gardens. So the reed bed sites are sort of working from the north. We've got the Grantham Canal in the northwest. I think that's Kellen Bridge. And then we've got the uh, Cosington Meadow in the Saw Valley. Um, Narbra Bog towards the south, Mr. Marsh is the very south, Irebrook Reservoir and Rutland Water. So actually, although it's been recorded from many tetrads, it's actually only probably a breeding species in a much smaller range of sites. And to give an indication of uh, the numbers here, from the whole of the Vice County, we've got 183 records of 2,222 moths. But of those, 116 records of 2,000 and more moths were just from Rutland Water. So we know that's where, it's a well-recorded site, but we know there's a really good colony there. And all of the records from gardens were singletons. So it's just the odd one caught from time to time. <clears throat> and again, it's associated with aquatic habit, habitats and a lot of species that are, do have the tendency to wander. And I think my theory is that they're, they must be prone to sites drying out, so they're always looking to colonise new areas. Hence, they will move from their breeding site and they happen to turn up in gardens on their travels. So. The good, the bad, and the ugly. So the good, it's a low cost, easy form of wildlife recording accessible to all. And I'll bring this picture up again because there is a serious message here. It is something that people like me, as you get older and you're not quite as fit and active as you used to be, or if you've got a disability, it's a form of wildlife recording you can do in your own garden. You can get lots of interest and produce a lot of useful data. You'll discover a, a moth fauna that you perhaps never realised and that varies from month to month and from year to year. But I think one of the main things is you never know what to expect. You never know the morning you go to your moth trap, what are you going to find under that last egg garden? Is it going to be that Clifton Nonpare or Convolvulus hawk moth you've been waiting years for? And the other thing is, as we've seen, beginners are just as likely to catch a rarity as experts. It's just a bit like the lottery. You've got to be in it to win it, though. So I always tell people, if you want to double your chances of catching a rarity, just operate your trap twice a week rather than once a week. But it can really help to improve our knowledge of the status and distribution of moths in VC55. So that's why I always welcome records and I never denigrate garden moth records. And of course, it's fun. 
Right, the bad. Yeah, I'm scratching my head now. I really had to think hard. What on earth can be bad about garden moth trapping? After a lot of thoughts, I've come up with a few possibilities. If you're new to it, it will take a while to get, get a grip with identification. But that shouldn't be an obstacle. There's good identification guides. There's people at the end of an email or on something like Facebook, the last year moth and butterfly Facebook site. People post photographs there. And honestly, sometimes you'll get an answer within minutes. So it's a lot easier to get help with identification. And I think providing you regularly practice, so as opposed to perhaps putting the trap out once every three months, if you do it regularly through the year, get to notice the changes and see the different species. I think you can make yourself certainly a competent moth recorder in a couple of years and probably an expert in five years. You have to put a bit of effort in though, I will admit. But it's not nothing like as difficult as identification used to be. The other thing is, don't get hung up with trying to identify everything. If you're a botanist, you don't go to a site and try and identify every species of plant. Or if you're a bird recorder, you don't list everything you see on your visit to rock the water. So if you struggle, just identify what you can. Well, on the bad side, cold and windy nights often mean empty traps, perhaps soggy egg trays. It can take over the top shelf of your fridge in summer, and this is a constant problem that I tend to have. There's always moss waiting to either be identified or photographed. And I'll admit garden moth trapping the data can potentially skew uh, moth data for the county, but I think its its potential risks there are far outweighed by the benefits of having more data. Again, in the ugly category, I've got I must put the large general wondering for the havoc that they can cause in one's moth trap in summer. And it is regrettable when moths die, but as long as you get to your trap before the sun's been on it, Moth fatalities in, tra in traps are a relatively rare thing. These are perhaps the real menace. I'm afraid moths do have a penchant for moths and they will get into your trap and eat the odd moth or two. But count yourself lucky. If you're moth trapping in a woodland, then hornets can often be a problem in late summer. And that can make going through your moth trap a scary experience. Now, some people like birds. I'll admit that's the case, but they can be real pesky predators. They quickly learn that there's a feast of moths to be had on the outside of your trap or on the nearby vegetation. And if you don't get up early, they'll be there first. And there's nothing worse than finding a blue hindwing next to your trap. My particular garden problem is with magpies. Magpies in my garden have learnt that if they land on the top of my trap heavily, it jars the trap and a few moths fly out. So if I want to avoid their disturbances, I try and get to my moth trap as early as possible. But this guy was my worst trap intruder. This was quite a few years ago, but one morning I actually got up and found a great tit actually inside the moth trap. And you see the devastation that it caused. There's a close up and you just see, I was just left with a load of wings and bird droppings. So it really had a massive feast. But there again, that's only happened once. And that's it. I'm struggling to think of any other ugly things. So that's the end. Happy to take questions. Thanks very much, Adrian. Um, that's that was great. Um, I think you've reminded us of uh, two really uh, useful things. 
The first is the the, the value of the data uh, that uh, we can we can get from this. Um, and uh, the second thing is the fact that it is supposed to be fun. I think mm -hmm. when when people occasionally can get trapped into in, in all forms of biological recording can get trapped into a mindset where that where you know as they say when the fun stops stop you know yeah. as you said stop recording um can, are you happy to take some questions yeah of course very good can i suggest um uh, could do you want to stop sharing your screen now so we can see people um uh, yeah sorry i thought i had that's okay uh, can i suggest uh rather than everyone shouting which tends not to work so well if you <coughs> um you can you can actually uh, use the chat window to uh put your hand up um or failing that uh if you'd like to wave at me uh then i'll i'll get you to uh ask your question so i don't know if anyone wants to go first if everyone's too embarrassed okay john yeah. Adrian, we often hear that there's been a, a disastrous decline in um, entomological numbers. Um, does the data that we've put together over the years support this? I mean, are we now uh, seeing far fewer moths in our traps than in the past? Or are we seeing roughly the same? Um, well, it's a good question. This is where, if you look at most species we're seeing more records but that's because we're doing more recording so the the big challenge is, is to try and find out you know it, it are changes just to, due to change in level of recording or is there a decline going on and i think we struggle to notice the declines but um i've been moth trap garden moth trapping for what well, let's say 37 years but I've only been using a, an MV trap for the last 15. So we don't really have long series from gardens. And it is very hard for me to try and um, replicate um, the declines that are being uh, evidenced nationally, largely because that's based on um, a standardized methodology. Roth Hampstead traps operated in the same way over many years throughout the country. It is hard for us. So the answer to your question is, it's hard for us to de detect. Um, anecdotally, yes, certainly things, there are less of things. Um, and certainly I go out in the, if I go out in the countryside, I'm not seeing the numbers I used to see. And I, I think gardens might be masking those changes because I think gardens are becoming increasingly important uh, for moths and probably for other species. And I look at the kilometre surrounding my garden, and there's a wonderful variety of habitats. You know, I've got black poplars, a stream, I've got an embankment of hawthorn and other shrubs, I've got grasslands. And you go out into, I don't know, East Leicestershire countryside, and you've not got that same variety. Um, so it's really hard to tell, but I just wonder if, um, the picture in gardens isn't quite as bad as it is in the wider countryside. Thank you. So we've got, we've had a couple of questions in the in the chat window. Uh, one is about moths in the fridge. Um, how long can you keep moths in the fridge? Uh, depends on the size of the moth. You're allowed to put them in the fridge. That is. <laughs> well, what other reasons do you have a fridge? <laughs> oh, food. That's it. Yes. Um, <laughs> Depends on the size of the moth. Um, some of the micros are perhaps only last a few days. Some of the larger moths, obviously, they've got less prone to dehydration. You certainly keep them for a few days a week at the most. And if it's something like a species that hi hibernates, I've currently got a dark chestnut in my fridge and it's been there for over a week. I'm waiting for a chestnut because I want to photograph the two side by side. Now, this is a species that hibernates flies in autumn, hibernates, flies again in the spring. So I think that'll probably be happy in my fridge for a few weeks, but I'll keep an eye on it. A few days, no problem. And there's a, a question from uh, Emma in the uh, chat window as well about uh, recommendations for starter kit for beginners and, and general guidance for people who want to start trapping. What would you advise? Um, 
I don't I don't know if Emma's in Leicestershire or Nottinghamshire. Oh well, no, I'm, I'm in Nottinghamshire. Okay, um, I think the sort of trap to look for. Don't I wouldn't spend too much. There's a lot of grossly overpriced traps on the commercial market. Um, look for something that uses. I would recommend a twenty watt WEM light or actinic lamp. Um, that's low cost. Doesn't need expensive control gear. Not too bright, but they're very good at catching moths. Um, so, as you know, I wouldn't spend too much at, at the outset. If you live in Leicester and Rutland, then we've got some uh, low cost traps that we can either provide people with or lend. Um, but I'm afraid I keep that offer to within the county. Um, <laughs> other kits, um, the two books I've mentioned there start with the micro book, Wellington Townsend, Sterling and Parsons, when you're ready to look at the micros then all you need is a few pots and a fridge. Would it be a good idea to contact the uh, county recorder, uh, Adrian? Uh, do you know who the county recorder for Nottinghamshire is? Yes, I do. Sheila Wright. Right. Um, yes, you can see if she can advise. Yeah, she might be able to help out with uh, equipment and stuff, possibly. Possibly. Yeah. Um, um, so uh, Margaret's got a downside of garden moth trapping, which is um, upsetting the neighbours. <laughs> how, how do your neighbours feel about you running your moth trap every night, Adrian? Um, they don't have much choice in the matter because I've lived here longer than any of my neighbours. So they moved into their house with a, uh, a bright light shining every night. So um, no, I've not had any complaints, but I do, so, uh, I managed to, I put it in the corner of the garden where the light shines out rather than back towards the adjoining neighbours. So if you're careful where, where you place it, um, it shouldn't be too bad. But as I say, if, if a, a murky vapour light's too bright, then one of these actinic lights wouldn't cause a problem anywhere. Anyone else want to um, ask a question or comment on anything? Hazel. You'll have to unmute yourself, Hazel. I can't lip read, I'm afraid. Um, Adrian, I, you you trap every night. Um, I've heard people say that they prefer not to trap every night because it, if you you run the risk of trapping the same moth several nights running which means it doesn't have a chance to make lay eggs or, or whatever do you feel that could be an issue or do you feel that there's plenty of time around your trapping for for normal things to be going on with the moss i mean sometimes you do get them laying eggs in pots don't you uh, it is a potential uh, issue but um i think if you're careful of how you release the moths, um, that can help. Um, I have a variety of techniques, but I don't just empty them in the garden. I, I ensure they're well dispersed and a lot of them will fly off. Um, so occasionally I'll, you know, I'll recognize them. I thought that was the brimstone with the smudged wing that's caught the night before. But uh, as I mentioned previously, I don't think garden traps are that, or moth traps are that efficient. Um, too often you you catch a moth one night and you it escapes you can bank on the fact oh, that it's the next night so i think it's not quite the problem it's made out to be particularly if you're careful on how you release them um from my perspective the, my other problem is i want as long a data set as possible so i'm trying you know I, I try and keep do the same thing year after year so i can make comparisons so my, my understanding is that people who've looked at this by doing catch mark release um, actually find that they recapture a very low percentage of, of moths from the same site night after night. So as you say, it does seem to be very efficient and, um, uh, and, 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 and you know, comparatively little to worry about, I think. Um, couple more questions. Poran, you've got a question. You've got your hand up. 
you want to unmute and ask your question? Hi. Oh, th thank you for the talks. Beautiful. Thank you. But the question I have is the chart you've got um, uh, where you've taken recordings of each day and then totaled it and as well as the oh. variety and totaled it. Are you presenting those? Um, are you doing it so that you can put a graph and see how things work out with relation to weather or is I mean, is there a reason? Yeah, I mean, um, well, I basically do it because each of those individual records will go into the database. Um, the totals is probably purely for my own interests, so to can see just how good a night it was. And, you know, that's where I can perhaps, I don't really have the time, but I'd like to go back and start doing some comparisons, you know, with 10 years ago on a similar night at the similar time of the year, what are the differences? Um, so it's basically a simple spreadsheet so I can make comparisons, um, but all the baseline data goes into the VC55 MOTH database. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, uh, there's another question in the um, uh, um, chat window about uh, how to release. Uh, do you release at day in the day or at night? Um, I release them straight away. Um, that's... I think uh, if you're if you're doing what I do, which is running a trap every night, then if you did release them and, uh, in the evening, in, you'd recapture a lot more. So I tend to release them um, in the morning, and I actually encourage them to fly off. So uh, you know, I can get, tap an egg carton like that. They'll usually take to the wing and disperse. I don't just shake them into the corner of the garden. I try to encourage them to fly away, but I do it in the morning. Um, the less time they spend, spend pent up in a trap, the better, I think. Do you have all the birds queuing up, following you around the garden when you're releasing them? Uh, yes, they do, but that's why I encourage them to fly away. And we've got, we've got someone who's been waiting to ask a question. Yeah, do you, do you want to ask your question? Um, I have had a problem with a domesticated cat. I was wondering whether you had problems with domesticated cats tearing your sheep. Um, luckily, no, don't have any cats anywhere near my god. So well, that's, a, that's not a particular problem. Um, there's a question about bats. Uh, do do moth trap do garden moth traps affect bats? I know I've seen moths swooping <coughs> over my moth trap, but I don't know what the impact of that is, or bats rather. Uh, yeah, I'm not the person really to answer that question. I, I, I mean, I know there is concern that if you run a, uh, from some quarters, if you run a moth light close to a bat roost, it can disturb their feeding um, habit, habits. Um, but I don't think you'd have those problems you know, with it, unless you've got a bat roost in your neighbours or your own roof sort of thing. Um, I often watch uh, uh, the bats at dusk when I sort of first put the trap on and they will swoop down and try and take them off that's low or not too low flying. Um, I think, I, I don't think it has much effect on them. Um, they don't, they're not dependent on sight for catching moths. Um, it might perhaps help them, you know, Attracting moths to a light brings the food together for them. Okay, uh, Ray, yes. Do you want to unmute and ask your question, Ray? <coughs> you, you're muted at the moment, Ray. You unmute your microphone. It switches up off again. <laughs> um, the business about uh, effective temperature and uh, whether the, they come back to the trap night after night, all these things have been studied in the 80s, and there are plenty of papers being published about these things. Um, and climate that will affect the sort of uh, level of catch you get, which is not surprising. Um, the other thing, of course, is uh, it's a bit of an advert now. Sorry about this, Adrian. Um, when you get bored with moths, look yeah. at the other stuff that comes to the light trap, especially caddis. Uh, you might think they're, they're funny little brown moths, but in fact, they're a totally different group, and we're accumulating data, especially Graham Kaler, who is very, very assiduous at collecting these things for me. And also, of course, yourself. 
I, I can I can second that. Um, I have to say the highlight of garden moth trapping for me <laughs> is all the things that aren't moths. And I, I certainly send Ray my caddis, uh, but also uh, I've been recording a lot of water bugs uh, this year and figuring out how to identify them, the finer points of identification, because they're they're not that easy. Uh, but I certainly record the moths, but I but I also look forward to all the things which aren't moths in the moth trap, uh, not not the hornets so much and the, and the wasps, but everything else. Sorry, Adrian. No, no, nothing to add really. Yes, I, I do try and send uh, Ray caddies from time to time, but it's usually only when I'm bored with the moths. <laughs> oh dear, what can, oh, oh, might as well send that caddies to Ray. I'll try harder, Ray. Particularly as I live next to a stream. Do we have any more questions? Anyone else want to comment on anything? Well, um, I hope it's been useful um, and um, particularly for um, uh, people who are new to moth trapping and, and, and people are, because I know we've got some, some veterans here who, who probably rival Adrian. Um, but um, uh, if you're considering starting, there certainly is a lot of book help available. The books that Adrian has referenced, uh, and also uh, if you're if you contact contact your county recorder, certainly in Leicestershire, uh, but also in other counties. Find out who your county moth recorder is, and contact them. And I'm pretty sure they will help you. So um, just to finish off, I'd like to just hand over now to uh, Hazel. Uh, to uh, our chair to just uh, uh, thank uh, Adrian uh, for this evening. Right, Adrian, thank you so much for agreeing to do this tonight. I've really enjoyed it. It's been really interesting. Um, I should imagine probably most people here probably do know you. Um, I've known you for several years now. Um, you've got such infectious enthusiasm for this subject and um, all the things you do like providing us with moth traps helping with id um the annual moth meeting um you just provide so much input into the county recording of moths we we are all just so grateful to you for leading this big team through this adventure I, I just love what you do. I love being part of this big family of moth trappers. Um, and thank you very much for this evening and for everything you do. Okay, I'm sure we'll thank all like much. to join That's in sort of a little clap for... <laughs> <Thank you. laughs>